let's turn to uh, the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12, and uh, today we will be looking at verse 15. Last time we unpacked verse 13, and this time we're going to be skipping verse 14 of Romans 12, which is, we're going to see in a few weeks, the quality of mercy. And I'm going to be skipping over that verse because Paul devotes the last five verses of this chapter to mercy as well. So important is that quality of true Christianity. So in a few weeks, we're going to combine verse 14 with verses 17 to 21, and we'll see that together they really pack quite a punch. The priority of showing mercy when you're wronged, just like God does. So for now, we're going to be looking, though, at the priority, really, of sympathy, which in many ways is just as important. Romans 12, 15, where Paul says that we're to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We come today to the seventh uh, attribute of Christ that we can now put on uh, those of us who have Christ in us to trigger the miracle of Christ through us. Now that we've been justified by faith, now that he lives inside us to sanctify us by faith, to make us better people, he can, he can do it in us. He can do in us what we could never do in and of ourselves when we choose just to put him on, as he says in Romans 12 too. When we just do it in dependence on him, we trigger the spirit of Christ through us. And we're going to see that, how that happens when it comes to the quality, the Christ-like quality of sympathy. In this case, we can show the kind of sympathy for one another that really does, in a lot of ways, turn us into a caring community as we rejoice with those who rejoice and uh, weep with those who weep. We're going to see that this is kind of like the, the, the super glue of the church family. As I've titled this sermon, today we're going to look at the necessity of a feeling body especially in a world that's colder than ever. We're told in the scripture, as you all know, that in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. Someone said that the world is full of lonely rooms and solitary places where people don't have much theology, but only an intimate and frightening familiarity with the problems of living and dying. So many people these days feel like Solomon said in Proverbs 14.10, that the heart is alone in its bitterness, and no one shares its joy. That's talking about sympathy there. It's like Cat Stevens used to sing, Oh baby, baby, it's a hard world. Or the Beatles, all the lonely people, where do they uh, all come from? Well, I'll tell you where they come from. They come from, the, from lives that have never been busier, sometimes through no fault of their own. And then look at what we do with the little free time that we have left. We plug into these, you know, into these virtual communities where we're together, we're together online, but we're not really together there on, in love. We plug into virtual realities that unplug us from uh, real relationships, and that's what can so easily consume our time. And like never before, real relationships are breaking down. Divorce rates have, have never been higher. Children have never felt more abandoned. Maybe you do too. Maybe that's the kind of past you came out of. I'll tell you where all the lonely people come from. They come from lonely rooms and uh, solitary places that have never been more connected, you know, but that leave us like totally disconnected. And the research is bearing this out on, on the effect of Facebook and other social media platforms. A recent article in The Atlantic is titled, titled Is Facebook Making Us Lonely? In the header it says this, Social media from Facebook to Twitter has, have made us more densely networked than ever, yet for all this connectivity, new research suggests that we have never been lonelier and that this loneliness is making us mentally and physically ill. A report, and it says this, this will be a report on what the epidemic of loneliness is doing to our souls and to our society. Maybe that's what you're feeling like right now. All the lonely people. There are a lot of lonely people out there. People who are dying for what we can have in here and what many of you do share in here. 
all the lonely people. That's why a friend of mine who doesn't attend church said this. He, he was hurting, and he came into my office and sat down and said, where do you find sympathy these days? I said, where? He said, you find it in the dictionary under S. Maybe you felt that way. Maybe you've made someone feel that way who shared with you, and you just gave them a quick answer or didn't really listen or whatever. Someone else said, sympathy is what one person offers to another to get all the details. Maybe that's how it's been used on you. Maybe that's how you've used it. Webster, on the other hand, speaking of dictionaries, defines it as the capacity to enter into the feelings of another, whether joyful or sorrowful. That's pretty biblical. It's what happens when we rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Another translation says, when others are happy, be happy with them. When they're sad, share their sorrow. There's so much here. According to the Apostle Paul here, it's one of the priority qualities of true Christianity, one that we tend to write off as, as something that's kind of, you know, secondary importance, in importance, and rather uh, kind of, I don't know how else to say it, rather unmanly. So much so that before we jump into these ver this verse, I think we need to clear up a couple of misconceptions from the rest of Scripture. First, is it secondary in, in importance? Well, far from being secondary, it is of supreme priority for a body to have what you might call sympathetic connections. Just ten verses earlier, back in verse 5, to put this in context, Paul sets the context for this verse. He says that we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. He's talking about the body when he talks about sympathy. Elsewhere, Paul says that in a healthy body, in a healthy family, it's what we read earlier in the service, 1 Corinthians 12, 26, when one member suffers, all the members suffer, and if one member is honored, all the members rejoice. In an unhealthy body, that doesn't happen. And without such connections, we know that the body will die. It's like leprosy. You may know that people who have leprosy lose their ability. They have it, and all these dismembered parts that, are, that have been distorted and deformed, they have it because they lose their ability to feel pain. It's not a disease of the skin, it's a disease of the nervous system. And this is why they lose their fingers and their hands. Dr. Dr. Paul Brand worked with leprosy patients in India for years, and he put it this way. Nothing arouses more distress in me than watching my patients in the care of a hospital lose touch with their own hands and feet. When pain fades away and they start viewing their own limbs as stuck up on appendages. You and I speak metaphorically of a hand or foot going dead when we have slept on it in an awkward position. Leprosy patients seem to regard their hands and feet as truly dead. The most common injury at Caravelle, uh, the kissing wound, occurs when a cigarette burns unnoticed down to the nub and brands matching scars into the skin between the fingers. The patients think of their hands as impersonal accessories not unlike a plastic cigarette holder. One such patient, who was gradually destroying his hands, said to me, you know, my hands are not really hands, they're things, just like wooden attachments. And I always have the feeling that they can re be replaced because they're not me. As a rehabilitation doctor in the hospital, I, shared, uh, I strive to remind the patients of parts of their bodies that they might forget about in the absence of pain. I spent much of my life repairing the damage that results when patients lower their guard. I would give anything to awaken in such people a sense of their body's unity. But overcoming this particular sense of detachment seems impossible without the sensation of pain. Just as pain unifies the body, it loses, uh, it, uh, its loss irresistibly destroys the unity. As we turn from the network pain in biology to its analogy in the body of Christ, comprising all believers, I am struck by the importance of pain in protecting and uniting that corporate membership as it does in guarding the cells of my own body. And then he concludes, in the human body, 
when an area loses sensory contact with the rest of the body, even when its nourishment system remains intact, that part of the body begins to wither and atrophy. I have examined severe injury or def uh, in, in, in the vast majority of cases, 90 to 100 uh, insensitive hands I examined, severe injury or deformation results. The body poorly protects what it does not feel. And in the spiritual body also, the loss of feeling inevitably leads to atrophy and inner deterioration. So much of the sorrow in the world is due to the selfishness of people. We suffer because we do not suffer enough. So first, so we'll really get into what sympathy means. We need to see why it's so important. And the first thing is that sympathy is no small thing. It's not optional. It's essential. Without it, the body will die. Far from being secondary, it's of supreme priority. That's the first thing. The second thing is this, briefly. The second thing is that it's not unmanly. It's what God does. If you look at the overall biblical and a theological context of this verse, which is so important here, you quickly see that it's what God himself does. It says in Isaiah 63, 9, all of you have read these verses, in all our afflictions he was what? Afflicted, that's sympathy. In Isaiah 53 it says, surely our griefs he bore and our sorrows he carried. In Psalm 56, David says this. He's talking to God. He says, You have kept count of my tossings, all the tossings on the bed. You have put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? According to Hebrews 4.15, famous verse, We do not have a high priest who cannot what? Sympathize with our weaknesses. He's talking about Christ. And so in Revelation 2.8, you see it all through the Gospels, him doing that, and at the end of the Bible, Revelation 2.8, we spent a whole Sunday on this a, a year ago. He said to the suffering church at Smyrna, I know your suffering and poverty. The word for know there is, I feel your pain. He feels his body. Duh. That's what we are. Which is why he said to Paul on the Damascus Road, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul was actually, as you all know, persecuting the church. But Christ said, why are you persecuting me? And then he said, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. Goads are like spurs on a horse. That is, you're digging the spurs into my body. It's kind of like the, the old African-American spiritual, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. Nobody knows like Jesus. Sympathy is manly. It's the son of man. And it's fatherly. It's in God the Son because it originates in God the Father. As we sang earlier, O come my soul, bless thou the Lord. In verse 3, quotes from Psalm 103, For just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. That's what we sang. Why? Sympathy, for he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. Thank God for that. Oh no, sympathy, one, is not secondary. And two, it's very manly and deeply fatherly. It's eminently godly. And according to the Apostle Paul in our passage for today, having put it in context, it has two parts. He says first, to rejoice with those who rejoice. Obviously, he wouldn't have had to say that if for whatever reason there were a tendency not to do it. We're not as automatically connected with pain in the body of Christ like we are in our own bodies. It's a choice. It's not automatic. It should happen immediately and spontaneously if we were really members of one body, but things get in the way. Things that quench the, you know, the spirit of sympathy that Christ wants to surge and to, through and to unite his body. The spirit of sympathy, the superglue, really, of a caring community that can bind us together in good times and in bad. There are many things that get in the way as we unpack this. We, you know, 
we all struggle with this. We get too busy with our own lives. We get uh, too burdened with our own cares. We get too, you know, maybe barren in uh, our own walk. But there's something else that I'd like to focus on today because another reason that we don't really rejoice with those who rejoice, why we often lose our capacity to enter into the, you know, the joyous feelings of another, sometimes anyway, it's jealousy. At least it, it's been that way in my life. Jealousy will quench, quench a spirit of sympathy that, uh, more, quick, more quickly than anything else. I, I, it'll, it, it, it'll quench it more quickly than you can say, it's not fair, God, look what they've got, and you're denying that to me. In fact, it seems that God often tests us by throwing in our face, or so it feels, people who are rejoicing because something has happened to them that we want to happen to us. Julie and I struggle with this for what seemed like an eternity many years ago. We went through three years of infertility uh, before we had our first son, Jordan, back in the 80s. And we learned during that time the truth of the proverb that says there are three things that will not be satisfied, yea, four that will not say enough, and one of those is the barren womb. One of the most difficult things in life. We went through three years of infertility at the same time you know, that the church we were in was, was going through something of a baby boom. And of course, new babies needed to be dedicated. We've served in churches that do baby dedications. We've served in churches that do infant baptisms. And, and there it was baby dedications. And of course, pastors do such things. And it just happened that I was an associate pastor and I was the resident baby dedicator. The senior pastor was training me and putting me through all sorts of things that were so good for me. And that was one of them. We talked about that. And he said, Brian, you need to learn something here. And so every quarter, you know, there they were. It was a church of about a thousand. And so every quarter, they were learned, there they were, all these parents glowing with joy with their little treasures in their arms lined up across the platform. These little miracles. Infant dedications were a big deal. And if for no other reason, you know, the sheer volume of kids that we went through, they, they were a time when we all rejoiced with those who rejoiced, and I was supposed to take the lead. And as I did, I learned something. It was up and down, back three steps forward, two steps backward. But I learned something each time I took a child into my arms and, you know, cradled it there and held it up to the congregation at the pulpit with a smile on my face. And I decided I'm going to make the most of this. And God led me to this. I didn't want to at first. I'm going to look up the meaning of their name of this priceless treasure and pray the meaning of their name as a blessing over the child. And Ju uh, Ju Julie would write cards to each parent just telling them how happy we were for them. And uh, she'd write out that prayer that I prayed so that they could keep it in the card the rest of that baby's life. And, and, um, and then as I turned that baby around and held it close, you know, that little face nuzzled next to my neck and prayed a prayer of thanksgiving for someone else's treasure, I learned something, and that is I learned that if you just do it, the joy will come. It applies to a lot of things that we're called to do. Not always, but the more you do it, the more it does. And the jealousy will go. I learned that our bad times can become good times if we rejoice with those who have what we don't have. It's a miracle, but it can happen. when we truly rejoice with those who rejoice. Because now that we've been justified by faith, now that he lives in us to sanctify us by faith and to turn us into better people, he can do in us what we could never do in and of ourselves when we choose to put him on. Remember Romans 12 too? When we just do it, we can trigger the spirit of Christ through us and that becomes not just volitional, but even emotional. As we rejoice with those who rejoice. But Paul also says that we're to weep with those who weep. Now again, he wouldn't have had to say that if, if maybe there were a tendency not to do this. It should happen spontaneously if we're really members of one body, automatically. But it's a choice, of course, unlike in our natural bodies. And things can get in the way. Things that quench the spirit of sympathy. There, there are many reasons why we don't do this, why we quench the spirit of who seeks to unite us through these sympathetic connections in a way that you can't be united in any other way. Both on the receiving end and the giving end. 
On the receiving end, sometimes the problem is that um, there are some, and you run into such people, sometimes I can be that way, who are too prideful to receive sympathy. It's like, don't pander me, don't feel sorry for me, and you feel embarrassed that you even offered sympathy. That can be a real problem. That's a whole other story. We're not going to focus on that today. There are many reasons why we don't do this. Let me just list a few on the giving end. One, we sometimes can think or say, they had it coming. Yeah, they lost their job, but I think it was their fault. And in your great omnipotence, maybe you tell them why. Not that we're to turn a blind eye to what needs to be said to a brother or sister. We're to speak the truth, but the time's got to be right. So often, our insight into their sin hardens our heart to their suffering. Your sharp eyes may be dead on, but your dry eyes are dead wrong. Because we're to weep with those who weep. What quenches the work of the Spirit? One, you can say or think that they had it coming. Two, you can say or think or feel, and I do this myself, I don't want to get involved. It's the tendency to make a, you know, a quick exit when you find yourself at the open door of someone's hurting heart. Because you don't have time. We're often, on top of that, afraid of that kind of intimacy, that kind of vulnerability, that kind of responsibility. If they unload on me, then what am I going to do with it? And that fear can divide a body into lonely rooms and solitary places. One, they had it coming. Two, I don't want to get involved. Three, closely related, I can't take any more of this. It's called compassion fatigue, whether from one person or from too many people. This applies especially to those with the gift of mercy, who sometimes take on more than they should. And yes, in your case, maybe you do need to take a break, take some time off to not get engaged with uh, uh, as many people for the sake of your long-term ministry. Depends on who you are. But you're the exception, not the rule. You're the example when it comes to weeping with those who weep. And we need to learn from these people. And I thank God that there are many like that in this church. One, they had it coming. Two, I don't want to get involved. Three, I can't take any more of this. Four, don't be a sissy. Maybe we don't say it, but we think, you know, if I were in their shoes, I don't think it'd be that hard for me. I mean, come on, get a grip. Get a life. Well, so what if their cat died? So what if that gal dumped him? She's not the only one in the world. He'll get over it. Now, sometimes people do need to get a grip. Some of those statements are true, and sometimes they should be spoken in love, but you've got to win the right to do it because that kind of statement can also be very dangerous. Without some tenderizer, you might say, it becomes like a meat cleaver. Like Proverbs 12, 18, there is one who speaks rashly like thrusts of the sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Without a compassion that enters into their feelings, those kinds of statements turns into judgments, into judgments that can just trample trample their hearts. Without a compassion that says, might not have hurt me, but they're hurting, so I'm hurting. They're not me, I'm not them. Some of you may remember a character named Rue, Rue was a baby kangaroo in Winnie the Pooh. He was the brother of Kanga. <laughs> of course, kangaroo. Well, one day Rue fell into the water and couldn't get out. And so all the, you know, the characters were all in a panic and in all the hysteria, no one was of much help while he was sinking in the water. And at one point Eeyore, the, the, the donkey, sat down with his back to the river and tried to get Rue to grab his tail, but Rue couldn't reach it because the tail wasn't long enough and, and uh, nothing was happening. And, and, but eventually Christopher Robin showed up and of course he was the only one who kept his head. He just got a stick and pulled him out. Well, everyone soon forgot about poor Eeyore and his wet tail. And when 
the poor donkey called it to their attention. Well, what would you have said to someone going through the misery uh, that only a donkey can understand? Would you have been like Christopher Robin or like Pooh Bear? Listen, Eeyore was sitting with his tail in the water when they all got back to him. Tell Rue to be quick, somebody, he said. My tail's getting cold. I don't want to mention it, but I just mention it. I, I don't want to complain, but there it is. My tail's cold. Here I am, squeaked Rue. Oh, there you are. Did you see me swimming? Eeyore took his tail out of the water and swished it from side to side. As I expected, he said, lost all feeling. No, numbed it. That's what it's done, numbed it. Well, as long as nobody minds, I suppose it's all right. Poor old Eeyore, I'll dry it for you, said Christopher Robin. And he took out his handkerchief and rubbed it up. Thank you, Christopher Robin. You're the only one who seems to understand about tales. They don't think. That's what's the matter with some of these others. They've no imagination. A tale isn't a tale to them. It's just a little bit extra at the back. Never mind, Eeyore, said Christopher Robin, rubbing the hardest, his hardest. Is that better? It's feeling more like a tale, perhaps. It belongs again, if you know what I mean. Hello, Eeyore, said Pooh, coming up to them with his pole. Hello, Pooh. Thank you for asking, but I shall be able to use it again in a day or two. Use what, said Pooh? Eeyore, what we are all talking about. I wasn't talking about anything, said Pooh, looking puzzled. My mistake again, said Eeyore. I, I thought you were saying how sorry you were about my tail being all numb, and could you do anything to help? No, said Poop, that wasn't me. He thought for a little and then suggested helpfully, perhaps it was somebody else. We can be clueless. But sympathy says, poor Eeyore, I'll dry it for you. And when you're sympathized with, you feel like saying, Christopher Robin, you're the only one who seems to understand tales. The others... They don't seem to think. They've no imagination. Sympathy, wrote one man, is the result of thinking with your heart without losing your head. Which, of course, was Christopher Robin. Weep with those who weep. I guess there's another reason why we don't do it, and that is because we've not been there. Hearts tend to grow hard if they've not been broken. But such hearts had better watch out because God has a way of breaking them for their own good. And then he'll comfort you in your affliction, 2 Corinthians 1.4, so that you may be then be able to comfort those who are in affliction. If you don't do it yourself, he'll do it for you. He'll soften you through a sorrow that will tenderize your heart. And really, by the end of our lives, this is what happens to most all of us. Because few of us have it on our own. Few of us have that kind of huh, imagination. It happened in a most unusual way. I've seen it several times in this congregation with an unusual number of you. Many of the seniors in our body know all about that, all about the agony. You've got your stories. The agony that is like the crucible of true uh, sympathy. Some of you are like this. It's from a sermon called D, uh, by, by a preacher, a reform preacher, D. DeWitt Talmage, back in the 19th century. He said, take an aged mother, 75 years of age, and she is almost omnipotent in comfort. Why? She has worked through it all. At seven o'clock in the morning, she goes over to comfort a young mother who has just lost her babe. Grandmother knows all about that trouble. 
Fifty years ago, she felt it. At 12 o'clock of that day, she goes over to comfort a widowed soul. She knows all about that. She's been walking in that dark valley for 20 years now. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, someone knocks at the door wanting bread. She knows all about that too. Two or three times in her life, she came to her last loaf. Oh, it takes these people who have had trouble to comfort others in trouble. Where did Paul get the ink with which to write his comforting epistle? Where did David get the ink to write his comforting psalms? Where did John get the ink to write his comforting revelation? They got it out of their own tears. When a man has gone through the curriculum and has taken a course of dungeons and imprisonments and shipwrecks, he is ready then for the divine work of sympathy. We have a lot of that in this church. We have many such broken hearts in this congregation, broken in lonely rooms, and they know what it's like to be in solitary places through whom the Spirit now surges to bind us together in good times and bad times. Senior saints who are the superglue of a caring community, and some junior saints too. And I praise God for you because it really does make a difference. It's not optional. It is essential. It's essential to the greatest of these, which is love. So how do you get it? Well, if Christ is in you, it is in you, so you just have to stoke it up. And how do you do that? Well, I learned about this early on in our early years of ministry. Back in the 80s, while we were still in Houston, I was called to a hospital to be with some parents who had just lost their six-year-old daughter. And I hadn't known that kind of grief. I, we didn't even uh, have kids yet. And, but I had just read that morning in my devotions in John 11, if you'll turn there. This is really important. In John 11... I had just read John 11 in my devotions, and the Spirit of Christ focused my attention like never before on verse 33. And I believe he did it to prepare me for that hospital call later that day. Lazarus had died, as you all know, and Jesus had just arrived on the scene. And it says in verse 33, when he saw Mary weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. I decided to dig into that verse, and what I noticed was this. The literal translation is that he troubled himself. It's a verb that's in the middle voice, and it means that he did something to himself. He troubled himself. And then it says this, and he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And then, of course, the shortest and one of the most famous verses in the Bible, Jesus wept. That sympathy. But where did it come from? How did he do it? He troubled himself. Apparently, at that point, he wasn't troubled enough for tears. And I don't blame him because he, he knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead in just a couple of minutes. And so he troubled himself. Which means he took the trouble that was going on around him and he troubled himself with it. He thought about it. He put himself in their shoes. He chose to be mindful of their frame, knowing that they are but dust. In all their afflictions, he was afflicted. And so around six hours later, after I had read this in God's word, there I was in the hospital, and I troubled myself. I put myself in their shoes. I walked the steps to the intensive care unit where their daughter still lay. And as I did, I thought hard about what it would be like. I hardly knew them from Adam, nor they me. I was new to the church, and so they were a little cold when I got there. Here's the pastor doing what he's supposed to do. But at the first tear that came down my cheek, they broke down. And they opened up, and we started talking. And that single tear, like super glue, cemented our relationship for the rest of our lives. 
didn't take away their sorrow. But it was no longer a lonely room, nor were they anymore in a solitary place. And I stayed there with them for several hours, and one after another from the church came in, and there were more tears, and at one point there were 15 in the room, and we just all held hands uh, around where this dear baby laid, and I'm telling you, as we prayed, it was no longer an empty room. Because the Spirit of Christ had joined us through all our tears. It really does make a difference. This isn't just a bunch of, you know, touchy-feely, nicey-nicey, syrupy crying. No, it's, it's heavy-duty lifting. It's manly. I learned that day that sympathy, as one man said, is two hearts tugging together at the same load. <laughs> there don't have to be answers. In fact, don't give answers. It's kind of like the game we used to play as kids. Maybe some of you did too, where where one of us would lie down and the rest of us would kneel down all around this person and then each of us would put a single finger under him and together we could lift him up. Which is what the body of Christ is all about as we weep with those who weep. Joe Bailey's, let me conclude, close with this, was a father who lost three children in the course of seven years, or several years, and he wrote a book called A View from the Hearse. I think his experience summed up what we're talking about today. I was sitting there, torn by grief. Someone came and talked to me about God's dealings and why it happened and hope beyond the grave. He talked constantly. He said things I knew were true. But I was unmoved, except I wished that he would just go away. And he finally did. Another came and sat beside me. He didn't talk. He didn't ask me leading questions. He just sat beside me for an hour and more, listened when I said something, answered briefly, teared up, prayed simply, and left. I was moved. I was comforted. I hated to see him go. Oh yeah, far from secondary, this is a supreme priority. It's very manly and deeply fatherly. It's the necessity of a feeling body.